We've all probably had different events in our lives that are memorable. Events that were potentially life-changing. An event that was supposed to be life-changing for me many years ago. My grandma was all excited. She was involved in city government, county government in the area where I grew up. And President Eisenhower was coming to town. And I got to shake President Eisenhower's hand. And the reality is, as a first grader, that was no big deal. (laughs) But it was supposed to be. My grandma could not figure out, why aren't you excited? He's just a bald man that I shook his hand. He was nice. He was wearing a nice black suit, white shirt, black tie. I can still picture the time. So it was memorable, but it wasn't life-changing. Now, I had another communication with another president later that was a little bit more life-changing because I got a letter in fact, I woke up early one morning because there was a knock on my dorm door. I'd been in the dorm room for two weeks. It was the day after Labor Day. And my cousin who worked in the food service, he was going to work. He had to be at work at 6 o'clock. It's quarter to 6. He's knocking on my door. And he has this letter. He'd been home over the weekend. And he says, here, this looks important. Your dad gave it to me to give to you. And it was from President Nixon. And it read... On October 21st, you will report to the AFEE station in Chicago, Armed Forces Entrance and Examination Station. That was life changing. That was scary. In fact, what that did, and, and, and this is not a good story, this is not a good thing, it threw me into enough of a tizzy that my Christian testimony began to slip very desperately at that time. And I I was, you know, obviously I was scared. They were bombing Vietnam at that time. And I'm thinking, oh no. Well, this morning we're going to look at something even far greater, far more impactful than any of that because Isaiah had a life-changing experience. It was one where he was literally confronted face to face with God's glory. And fortunately, he was also confronted face to face with God's grace. You see, in that day and age, and even today in a certain sense, I think if we have that type of a confrontation with God, it's entirely possible that God's holiness, His extreme utterly out-of-this-world holiness would consume us because of our sinfulness. And we have to get that picture. God is so out-of-this-world holy that He in our presence could consume us because we have a problem with sinfulness. We all do. So Isaiah was confronted by God's glory. He was also confronted by God's grace. Because he was not consumed. And the text reads, basically, in the year of King Uzziah's death. Now that's important. We'll look at that in a few moments. In the year of King Uzziah's death, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord seated on high. An unbelievable display. Something that was far beyond any of us could ever conceive. And he was seated on a high, elevated throne. And it says the hem of his robe literally filled the temple. And his majestic splendor fills the entire earth. That's Isaiah's experience, and we're going to look at that today. And I'm entitling that in a certain sense, holy, 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 because the seraphim, the angelic presence in that vision that day, they expressed over and over before Isaiah, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is saturated by His majestic splendor. And they express that. And the reality is, is that is a breathtaking experience. That is a fearful experience. That is also a cleansing experience. 
And on that day, in a certain sense, they developed the holy, holy, holy cleaning service where no mess is too messy. Now, the, the center point of what we're looking at today, and I'm going to say this now, I'm going to say this at the end, and this is where we're going to draw application because this is vital for all of us this morning, and that is that the more I'm exposed to God's presence, the more that I recognize God's presence surrounding me, the more that I'm exposed and drawn into God's presence, the more that I enjoy God's presence, the more that God's presence is right there with me, the more that I will be aware of, first of all, the holiness of God. The holiness of God. And you know what? That's something, in fact, I'll tell you, Justin read a book that I borrowed from me. He and I are the two that I know read that book in this room. It was a book that, that... A pastor wrote a few years ago entitled, There's a Hole in Our Holiness. Because we don't get a grip. We don't grasp the importance, the concept of the fact that God says, I am holy, so therefore you too, you should be holy. God desires that and He makes it possible for us. So the more that I'm exposed to God's presence, the more I'm going to be aware of His holiness. And His holiness is going to shed light on my unworthiness. Because there's not any one of us that is here today that can stand before God and say, hey, I'm worthy of all that You've done for me. I'm worthy of getting into heaven all by myself. I can do it on my own. And yet, you know, I've sat at at funeral services before and I've heard pastors say at the end of the service, now I know today that as this person is before the judgment of God, which their timing is a little bit weird because the person probably died five days ago, But as this person for the judgment of God, I guarantee that God is now weighing His good deeds against His bad deeds and His good deeds are going to outnumber His bad deeds. And I want to scream when I'm in that place. In fact, that happened one time at a funeral and I had been asked to speak afterwards. Oh, I had to bite my tongue. But I told the truth. But that never happens. We are never able to outdo our bad deeds with our good deeds. And God's holiness, when we are actually exposed to God's holiness, it sheds light on our unworthiness, our need for Him, our need for His help. And then finally, because we need His help, because we are exposed to His holiness that sheds light on our our unworthiness, we're also more aware of His grace. His grace. He did not say to me, okay, you got to do it on your own and you're not going to make it. He did tell us that if we try to do it on our own, we're not going to make it, but He didn't say you have to do it on your own. He said, I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to provide for you a way. And that's what we find in this passage in Isaiah 6. That's what we find in John 3.16. That's what we find in 2 Corinthians 5.14 and 15 that we're going to use as we close this, this message today. But let me say this one more time. I know it's sitting on the screen in front of you, but the absolute truth is the more that I'm exposed to God's presence, the more God's presence becomes real in my life, the more I'm going to be aware of His holiness, which is infinite, and ours isn't. So therefore, we'll also be more aware of our unworthiness and we will be able to see very clearly His graciousness. But now I ask a question. Several questions as we prepare to dig into the Word today. And I want us to think clearly on this one. In a true way, how often am I exposed to God's presence in a personal way? How often do I actually take the time to say, okay, God, I'm here with you today and I want you to reveal yourself to me. I want you to show me exactly what you think of me. I want you to show me exactly what you desire for me. 
I want you to show me who you are, God, and what you're involved in doing. And as I ask that question, as I phrase that, you know what I think the real issue is in our culture today? We are so busy. We're so focused on our own stuff. I'm focused on my own stuff way too much, and I admit it. I have certain idols, certain addictions that, you know, while across the board, they don't seem to be so threatening. They don't seem to be so bad. But I mean, hey, the Cubs went into extra innings last night. I mean, on a Saturday night, they're not supposed to do that to me. And they won. But see, we get so focused on the stuff that we enjoy, the stuff that we want, that sometimes that exposure to God's presence becomes secondary or thirdary. Is that a word? So we ask that question. Secondly, what habits... What routines, what personal desires or obligations do I have that interfere or possibly block my focus on the Lord God? How many things are there in my life that interfere with me being able to see God? And let me, let me use an illustration of what happened with me this morning as I'm riding my bike here. I'm riding west on one of the streets near our house to get over to Mason Street. And I'm looking and I look over the trees and I see a thundercloud bank and I said, oh no! Because you know what? I've learned. I don't, I don't ever believe that thing on my phone that tells me what the weather's going to do. It lies to me all the time. I've been caught in the rain so many times. But I'm looking and I see this bank of clouds and I'm thinking, oh no, that can't happen now. We can't have a thunderstorm now. There's too much activity planned at church. You know what though? I got over to Mason Street and then I got to Northland and I looked to the west and I could see that same cloud of thunder, thunder, that bank of thunder clouds, but I could also see all the blue that was hidden by the tree line. Didn't have clear exposure. You know what? There are so many things that happen in our lives, so many activities, events, habits, routines, desires, obligations, that they they block out the blue skies. They block out the power of God. They block out the fact that God wants to be part of us. And we get so single focus. We get so blocked by the stuff. What do I treasure? What things do I treasure that, be, that, that, that would become a replacement? What do I treasure that becomes a replacement for God? What are the idols that truly are part of my life? Let's be honest with ourselves. If I felt that there was the appropriate time here or the appropriate situation, I'd say, tell somebody about it right now and and someday maybe we'll do that occasionally. In fact, what I want you to do, tell somebody else later today, what are the idols? What are the treasures that sometimes become a replacement for God in your life? We all have plenty. Is the Lord God an active part of my life? In all reality, how many hours, how many minutes, how much of every day do we spend relating to God so that He is an active part of our lives? And the last thing that I have to ask, because it's the logical conclusion to this set of questions. And I, I did, in fact, I had so much research that I could have thrown before you today from Barna and from other surveys that are done in our country about the amount of focus on God in our lives. That I could say, you know, the last one that I saw was is that 44% of, the, of our nation, according to the surveys of Barna, never ever considers God. 44%.
So I ask the question, is God even part, is God even on anywhere on your radar screen? Because that's an important thing we need to grapple with. So that's all introduction. Now let's dig into the text because this is going to, the text is so clear and so vivid for us today that it, it's going to be something that's going to go quickly. Because the day that changed, or the day Isaiah's life was changed, I can read, I just memorized it in a different way than put it on screen. Reality, the first thing we see in this passage is that the Lord revealed Himself. The Lord revealed Himself in a vivid, very unique, special, life-changing, breathtaking way. Where suddenly Isaiah, the prophet, now he's a prophet, he's already a prophet, he's already called by God to be God's servant. Some of the folks, some of the so-called experts that look at this passage, they think, no, this is Isaiah reviewing what happened before. I don't believe that for a moment. I believe that this book was written chronologically and Isaiah had been out there preaching the, the judgment and the warning of God to the people prior to this event. Why do I say that? Because Isaiah's ministry started during Uzziah's reign, not after Uzziah died. And Isaiah writes and says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord seated on a high elevated throne. The hem of His robe literally filled the temple. Get that picture. Seraphs, the angelic presence in the room, stood over Him. Each one had six wings. With two they covered their faces. Why did they cover their faces? I believe they covered their faces because the brilliance of God's glory was so bright that they needed some, some cover. With two, they covered their feet. Can't explain that one. And with two, they used to fly. The remaining two. And it says they called out to one another. They're calling out to each other and they're saying, holy, holy, holy. And you know what? There's never a time in the Scriptures, in the Hebrew or the Greek, either one, where any other word is used in triplicate. They never say glory, glory, glory. They never say any other thing. But they say holy, holy, holy. And that provides this complete emphasis on the fact that He is absolutely holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. His majestic splendor fills the entire earth. The sound of their voices shook the door frames. And the temple was filled with smoke. What do we have here? We have here the phrase, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord on a high and elevated throne. There's historical background behind this. We have to understand that. We have to get a grip of this. See, Uzziah was a good king for Israel, for the, Jew, for the Jewish people. He's the first positive king they had after Solomon. And Uzziah brought tremendous advancements to the nation story is in history books that he even developed for various areas of Jerusalem, he had developed a system of of indoor plumbing. The technological and the social advancements that were brought about in Uzziah's reign were amazing. He was a genius when it came to various things that he did. They enjoyed tremendous prosperity during that time. They were wealthy. They had things good. Nations around them were a little fearful of them. But yet, in the care of King Uzziah's death, foreign nations became a threat to their security. And that is all because during Uzziah's reign, because of his accomplishments, because of what he had done as a king that was successful and popular, the eyes of the nation... So many in the nation were focused on Him and not on God. 
and he had replaced God. And I want to pause for just 30 seconds and ask, does that happen to us? Yes, it does. We love the prosperity that comes from various things that happen in Washington or Madison. We love the advancements that we enjoy, technology and otherwise, and wow, aren't we able to do so much? But my view of God suddenly changes. And Uzziah became so prideful, he became so full of himself that he decided one day that he was going to do what the priests do and he went into the temple and he burned incense as a priest only could do and God struck him immediately with, with leprosy. And Uzziah, he lived for the rest of his life separated because of leprosy. When Uzziah was, was when he died, he was no longer, he was not allowed to be buried with the rest of the kings of, of the Jews. He had to be buried in a separate tomb. A tomb, and they, they didn't dedicate it. Well, this is for great Uzziah. No, it was the Uzziah, the king that had leprosy. God punished him. So in the year of King Uzziah's death, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord because you know what? God took Uzziah out of the way. But now the next thing we see here is that Israel, or Isaiah, I'm sorry, Isaiah was exposed then to God's holiness and His majesty. The holiness of God and the majesty of God. And we've talked about that a little bit already. Literally, holiness in the Hebrew and in the Greek both, the word means distinct, separate, and in a class all by itself. There is nothing like it. And the idea of God's majesty is majestic presence it's described by the phrase that the seraphim said, the whole earth is saturated, literally filled, filled to the brim with His majestic splendor. And that was so impactful, that was so powerful that the praise of the angelic presence, the seraphim, it shook the foundations of the temple. It was like an earthquake. So the next thing we see, Isaiah's seen the revelation of God. He's been exposed to the presence of God in a powerful way. And suddenly Isaiah recognizes, oh no, I'm a sinful person. And we have to understand the display of God's holiness and majesty in every case will expose a, the darkness of a sinful life. The reality is when God's Word is, is, is elevated and preached in a powerful and relevant way, when God's people are living lives that are set apart and not pompous, not prideful, but yet pious before God, the holiness of God basically exposes the darkness of sinful life. I can't say that I've had this happen to me as often as I think it should. But I've seen where times when I will be around some people or whatever else. I'm not talking about any of you. but I, In fact, when I worked for the rescue mission the couple of years before I moved here, and I was dealing with different individuals all the time, when they saw me as just somebody that was coming out to pick up a donation for them for the rescue mission, they looked at me one way, but when they found out that, hey, this guy's a pastor, suddenly, they're, oh, they wanted less to do with me. And what did I do? Nothing. In fact, if they'd have watched me very long, they'd have seen, hey, there's no reason for me to be fearful around this guy. But yet, this sense of holiness and majesty, it exposes darkness, and people get uncomfortable around that. And the reality is God's holiness should humble us. It should bring us to our, uh, our, our sense of, okay, God, I, I need you desperately. And God's majesty should literally drive us to our knees. 
It's said often that the, one of the problems with evangelical churches like ours is that the sanctuary is not a sanctuary. It's not a place where I'm reverent before God. Now, I'll admit that I'm a little colloquial. I'm a little common. I'm a little casual. On, you know, I, I, will, I won't preach on, in shorts here except for on Messy Fest Sunday, but it wasn't warm enough this morning. So I'm casual, but you know what? I do admit to you that sometimes, you know, when I was a child, when I was growing up in the church where I grew up, when you were in the vestibule before church, you'd talk with people, you'd joke with people. The minute you entered the doors of the auditorium, the sanctuary, you were quiet. And as a child, sometimes they say, hey, mom, she shh. Now, the rigidness of that is scary to me, but yet the sense of reverence in that is appealing to me. And the holiness of God should humble us. The majesty of God should drive us to our knees in reverence before Him. And Isaiah's words Woe to me! Woe is me! I am destroyed! I am ruined! My lips are contaminated! They're con contaminated by sin, he says. I live amongst people whose lips are contaminated. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. And Isaiah expresses that in their two immediate realities. He acknowledged the fact that he was contaminated by sin. Contaminated lips, he expresses. My lips, my mouth is contaminated. My mouth is, is evil. And he expresses contaminated lips in the sense of himself and those around him. Those around us. Those around me. And what's the truth of why he used mouth there? I can't say 100% because God didn't say, well, this is what this means. But as I draw application of this, it's saying he had an inability to praise God like the seraphim did. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of heaven's armies. Holy, holy, holy is He. His glorious splendor, it fills, it saturates the earth. And Isaiah is saying, I can't say that. Because my lips are contaminated. And that represented an unclean heart that was saturated by sin. And the second immediate reality is confession. Confession. Isaiah said, I can't do anything but confess before this holy God. I need you. And I think it's important for us to see this idea that in seeing God for who He really is, then we see ourselves for who we really are too. And therefore, then we can accurately evaluate our condition. And we can confess our sin before a holy God. And what's involved in confession of sin, let's realize that literally the word confession, it means agreeing with God and making a basically this statement, God, I fall short of your perfect standard. I'm short of what you desire. I cannot, meet your ma I cannot match your holiness. And I admit to you that I do wrong. And let's realize something here. Confession has become chaotic. It's become confusing. It's become controversial through the years. Because so people ask, do I have to confess every day? Do I have to give God a grocery list? What do I need to do? Well, let me just say this simply. Confession is never a ritual or a mindless repetition. If it becomes that, it's not real. It's never, well, God, I'm sorry, and I'll try more next time. It should be a sensitive heart before a holy God, a sensitive heart toward God's Spirit that's working to help us recognize when sin is taking control of our lives. And you know what so often happens? We are so dis distant from the presence of God that when sin starts to control our lives, there isn't that 
urging that says, hey, deal with it. Why? Because we live amongst a people that have the same types of sins as we do. It becomes commonplace. It becomes natural. It becomes what everybody's doing. We redefine sin so many times. In fact, as we acknowledge the presence of sin in our lives, let's realize our culture has so much redefined sin that it seems rare for anyone to truly recognize personal sin in the way that Isaiah saw it. Back in 1997, every year in January at, at Peoria Christian School, it's where my kids went to school. My, my son was, was, was an 8th grader at the time. Our younger daughters were a little bit lower than that. The 8th graders were involved in the high school chapel services and they had, literally, they had a revival that was amazing that year. And a man named Tom Meharis that came and spoke and, and, and there, were, there were young people that were admitting involvement with rich, witchcraft. There were young people that were literally crying on their knees before a holy God saying, I'm so sorry for what I've done. And I was, I was witness to some of those things and it was just amazing to see because people acknowledged in that particular time frame that, hey, we've made light of sin. We've made light of wrongdoing. We've just been... See, we've seen sin as so commonplace that it's just fine that everybody does it. And let's realize sin should never be something that's funny or humorous. We ought not laugh at sin because it's not funny to God. Secondly, the only person in history who was born without sin, sinful nature was our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one. And we are all sinful but the good thing the positive step. The great part of the message is God's love and grace are greater than all our sin. God's love and grace is greater than every bit of my sin. And therefore, what we see in the passage is Isaiah experienced the removal of his guilt. The Lord removed Isaiah's guilt. As we see the passage, it says, but then one of the seraphs flew toward me in his hand was a hot coal he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, look, this coal has touched your lips. Your evil, your guiltiness is removed. Your sin is forgiven. And I believe that as we look at that passage, the coal there, the experiencing the cleansing from sin... The coal in Isaiah's life symbolized the cleansing effect of fire and the idea of purifying judgment that God has that is necessary because His wrath says, I can't accept evil or sinfulness. This is God's judgment being pictured in a coal touching Isaiah's lips because the reality is if we don't confess our sin before a righteous God, if we don't take the provision that God has given for us through Jesus Christ for our sin, our sinfulness is going to face the wrath of judging fire. And we can't avoid that unless we trust in Christ. And we find in 1 John 1, beautiful words, let me just read it out, it's on the screen. God is light and in Him there is no darkness whatsoever. If we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah's sin was removed. Our sin can be removed through Jesus Christ. And as we look at that, we look at the rest of the passage and we draw some applications and we're done. But realize the sequence of events in this section, it can't be ignored. Isaiah, therefore, was requested by God. The Lord requested Isaiah to give him a response of obedience. The Lord requested Isaiah to give him a response of obedience. In the sequence of events, first of all, God revealed Himself. 
of Isaiah. Secondly, Isaiah recognized his sinfulness before a holy, righteous God. His, con- his, his con- contamination led to confession. God removed Isaiah's guiltiness. Whew, it's gone. Confession led to cleansing. And then God requested, after the cleansing, I want obedience. I've got something for you to do. His cleansing led to a calling. And he was better able to see what God wanted. And I want to just say this morning, very simply, many people are confused. What does God want from me? What does God desire from me? What should I be doing? I don't understand. I'm so confused. One of the reasons why we're confused is because we've not gone through the steps. We've not allowed God to reveal Himself to us and say, okay, I'm contaminated. I need to confess before you, God, that I'm, I'm falling short. And God will remove that sin from us through Jesus Christ and His death at Calvary and our trusting in Him. And once that's removed and once we have it straight with God, God can say, hey, i got a job for you to do. But you know what? So many times we get it all mixed up and we got people that are involved in ministry, not necessarily here, I'm not pointing at any person here. Understand that. But across the country, we've got so many people that are involved in ministry activities and they've not been cleansed. And some people say, well, maybe, maybe, maybe God will use that to draw them to Himself. You know what? No, you've got to have that breaking point where God's holiness reveals, I'm contaminated. So as you look at the section then, this portion of the passage, it's longer, so let, bear with me as we look at it. It says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom will I send? Who will go on our behalf? I answered and said, Send me. Here I am. Send me, Lord. And He said, Go and tell these people. Listen continually, but don't perceive. Make the hearts of these people calloused. Make their ears deaf and their eyes blind. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears. Their hearts might understand and they might repent and be healed. And Isaiah says, how long is that going to take? How long do you want me to do this? This sounds like a tough job. I'm not sure I like this, God. What do you want? What do you desire? How long, O oh Lord? And he says, until the cities are in ruins and unpopulated and the houses are uninhabited and the land is ruined and devastated. And the Lord has sent the people off to a distant place and the very heart of the land is completely abandoned. God's giving Isaiah a picture of what's going to happen to Israel if they fail to repent. And he's essentially saying, Isaiah, I hate to say this, but it's not going to be a good result. In verse 13, he says, even if only a tenth of the people remain in the land, the land's still going to be destroyed. He says, like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it's, when it's knocked down, when it's chopped down. He says, the holy seed is its stump. That's God saying the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. I'm promising the Messiah. And what we have here is that God is committing Isaiah to service. He's saying, you know, I've got a job for you. And at that point, Isaiah is able to recognize God's call upon his life. He was able to recognize once he was cleansed and forgiven. And then God, interestingly enough, God sent Isaiah, a man of unclean lips whose lips were clean, cleansed. He sent him to a people with unclean lips. But he could send him because his lips had been cleansed. Isaiah gave some, or God gave Isaiah some very specific instructions in this passage. We looked at that briefly. And he warned him, you know, this isn't going to be easy, Isaiah. This is not a coasting type job. But Isaiah was willing, ready, and able to do what God asked. And the last thing we want to look at before application is we see God's call for faithfulness there. For us, God's call upon our lives. If we are exposed before a holy God and says, God, I confess I'm cleansed through Jesus Christ. If that's the case for us, God's call upon our lives is faithfulness. 
God told Isaiah that his work would be difficult because he'd be preaching to people with hard hearts. I've seen it. The goal of every ministry is not I'm going to be successful. The goal of every ministry is faithfulness that brings glory and honor to God. That's our first goal. I want to honor God. I want to be faithful to what God's asked me to do. God will deal with the results. God requires us to be faithful to what He's asked us to do. And the measure of our success is our faithfulness, not our personal results. God's asked us to sow the seed, but He is the only one who can bring the produce, the growth, and the harvest. And personal applications as we look at this, as we just draw some conclusions. Very quick, very brief, very straightforward. First of all, understanding our need for God's grace. There are so many people in our culture today who have a hard time getting to the place and some even as if they seem as if they will never get there that place where they admit that, God, I need your grace. That's a blocking point for so many folks. Let's realize the Lord never calls the righteous. He never calls the righteous, but He constantly is seeking sinners who are willing to repent. That's me, that's you. I fall short. I stumble. God, I'm sorry. Send me out again. Help me be faithful. Help me do what you've asked me to do. There's not one of us that can make it on our own. But we desperately need to acknowledge and accept God's gracious provision that saves us from the penalty of sin. And that gracious provision also sets us apart And we're mindful of John 3, 16 and 17. It says, For in this way God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son that that everyone who believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And verse 17 is just as important as 16. It says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn, but that the world should be saved through Him. Wow. Wow. Or 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 and 15, my two favorite verses in all the Bible. It says, For the love of Christ controls us, since we've concluded this, that, that Christ died for all. He died for everyone. Therefore, all have died in Christ. And He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. but for Him who died for them and was raised. Who are you living for today? What things, what people, perspectives, problems, personal pursuits, or pride, what of these things are blocking our view and vision of God? What's getting in the way? There are things for all of us that will interfere with our view of that holy, righteous God that has provided for us graciously. And as we consider that, let's ask very clearly, how often am I exposed to God's presence in that personal way that that God desires? How often do I say, God, enter into me? Enter into me right now. How often am I attentively reading the Word? Or is my view of God's Word as well, uh, you know, it used to be an hour a day keeps the devil away. Now it's, you go to the bookstore and it's the one minute devotional. A minute a day keeps the devil away. Untrue. Because there needs to be an attentiveness. There needs to be a sense of I'm listening, I'm hearing, I'm watching, I'm seeing. What do you got for me, God? Am I actively praying and seeking His face or is my prayer time, Lord bless this food, for Jesus' sake, amen. I'm done for the day. Am I alertly observing God at work around me? Am I seeing God at work? Am I praising Him for what I see or do I sit and look and say, well, what's going on there? 
Am I allowing God to guide my actions? Or finally, am I affectionately worshiping and praising Him? Or am I distracted? Our central focus today. The more that we are exposed to the holiness, the faithfulness, the graciousness, the omnipotent power, The holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The more we're exposed to God's presence, the more we draw into Him and say, God, take over in my life, the more that happens, the more we're going to be aware of, wow, He's holy. He's distinct from all else. He's out of this world holy. And I'm in this world unholy, unworthy. But God, you sent Jesus to take my place. You sent the Holy Spirit to give me the guidance and the the lifestyle that I need to have. So your grace, your, your grace that saves, your grace that sustains, it's so powerful. Let's pray. Father, as we look today at this, I I don't I don't want to preach any in my prayer. I just want to say, please take over. If it happens to be that there are people here today that have been challenged by the reality of what the passage teaches, help them to seek out someone during our activities following the service. If there's anyone here today that is saying, okay, I've heard this and now I realize, mm, your holiness, dear God, it's making an impression on me. It's shedding light on my unworthiness. God, if that's the case, please bring the results that only You can bring. Help us respond in the way that You want us to. Help us to do the things You want us to do. Help those of us that are following Jesus Christ and seeking to be faithful. Help us to reach out with the message of encouragement and the message of truth. God, do something special in this place today, I pray. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.